Chris Kennedy. Um. All right, good morning to everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started with Bible class. If you haven't had the chance already, make sure you meet Miss Jean Westmoreland over here sitting next to Delana. They're very closely related. That's Delana's mom. So she's able to be with us today. We've had a big time, and from now on, when we play Alabama, she'll have to come over to our house because she cheered to victory last night at our house. And she was mighty excited too. Our lesson this morning comes from Matthew chapter 7. We've been looking at parables of Jesus. And we're going to talk about his likening of listening and obeying and doing the will of God to two builders. Let me give you a little bit of background to this uh, lesson. It's found in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. I think these are penetrating words. These are words that should speak to everyone to make sure that we are authentically following Christ. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, 
and done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, we can see that John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh unto the Father except through me. And we point to that Scripture and say that while it's not politically correct in our day and time to say this, that all of the world needs to come to Christ. That world religions, while parts of them may have some benefit for some of the good they accomplish, salvation is not found in Buddhism. Salvation is not found in Shintoism. Salvation is not found in Hinduism. Salvation is not found through Muhammad. Salvation for all men everywhere is only through Jesus and obeying Him as Lord and Savior. Well, this particular passage also calls attention to the fact that not everyone who is an adherent to Christianity is going to be saved. How concerning is this passage of Scripture to those who claim Christianity. Jesus says, not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. And I broke it down like this. I call it the judgment day surprise. Because there will be people on the day of judgment that will have had no clue that they were lost. And it will be a huge surprise to them on that day. Because Jesus said, on that day many will say to me, because he's going to, in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 31, it says, When the Son of Man shall come in all His glory and all His holy angels with Him, He shall separate them from one another as the shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And there, in that separation, there are going to be people that are going to be separated to the other side and are going to find out for the first time that they're lost, even though they thought they were saved. Even though they thought, as adherents of Christianity, that their life was right with God. And so, even if you call Him Lord, even if you acknowledge Him as the Lord, it does not guarantee one's salvation. And yet, you will hear people quote a passage of Scripture that says, and whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And what I want to suggest to us today is this. That is not a prescription for how to be saved it is simply pointing us to the source of salvation. Whoever calls on the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. He is the only source of salvation. Calling out Jesus' name is not going to save you. Just saying He's Lord is not going to save you. There are going to be people on that day that have called Him Lord and call Him Lord on the day of judgment. Lord. Lord. Twice. Twice. Total shock and dismay. Second of all, he says, many will be lost who have prophesied in my name. The word prophet means a mouthpiece of God. In the Hebrew, which is the source of the word, it's nabi, which literally meant the mouthpiece that you put in your mouth to blow into an instrument. I played trombone and I used to have that little mouthpiece that I would slide into the end of the trombone and I would blow into it. And I will tell you that it's a lot harder than it looks. But that is the mouthpiece. The spokesperson for God. That God speaks through them. Lord, have I not spoken Your Word through me to others? Have I not prophesied in Your name? So, to proclaim God's Word is not a pre is not a finalization of one's salvation. Some will say, I have cast out demons in your name. And in your name I have done many wonderful works. Now think about that for a minute. There are some people in the name of Christianity that if you flip through the channels enough or you get on some Christian broadcasting networks, you can see people who claim Christ, who will acknowledge Him as Lord, call Him Lord, who will say they can heal, 
who say they can cast out demons. And yet the Bible says that that is not the litmus test of faith. That is not the litmus test of whether or not you're authentic as a Christian. How does that impact you? Scary? Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of when Philip went to Samaria and he preached the gospel and people believed and the Samaritans, many of them were baptized and became Christians, that Simon the sorcerer also believed. And the Bible says he believed and was baptized. What does Jesus say about that? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Did Simon do what Jesus asked? He's, the Bible says he believed. It doesn't say Simon said he was a believer. The Bible says Simon believed and was baptized. And yet, when he saw that it was through the laying on of the apostles' hands that the power of the Spirit was given, he offered the apostles money that he might receive that same power. And Peter said to him, Repent, or your money perish with you. And he said, Pray to God on my behalf that this, this will not come upon me. Um, and, and so, the scary part of this is, is that there are going to be people that took upon themselves some form of Christianity and yet they didn't have a relationship with Jesus. It's not about religion. It's not about what you call yourself. It doesn't matter what your affiliation is. What matters is, do you have an authentic relationship with Jesus as Lord and Savior? And when that happens, the Bible says... Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So that as you and I come to know Christ and our sins are removed by His blood, as we obey the Gospel, we're automatically added to His church. And so that's when we know that we're saved. Our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And unless it's blotted out, and we've already seen in the Revelation that Jesus Himself says that if some people don't repent, their name is going to be blotted out. And how that can mean anything but the loss of one's salvation, I don't know what they think that could mean. If your name's not in the book of life, guess what? You're not going to be saved. Okay. So, these, these are the things that Jesus is saying before this famous parable. Um... When we were kids, we learned it. Vacation Bible school, we learned it. The wise man built his house. Remember? Of course you do. Then here's our lesson for today. Therefore, whoever hears these things of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Now I want to think about that because recently we had Hurricane Ian come through down in southern Florida. Uh, I have some friends that I went to school with. They're in Fort Myers. Their um, parents' house was completely washed away in the flood, in the, the, power, the surge, I guess you call it. Uh, their house, the roof was removed, part of it, and most of their inside furnishings were destroyed. Uh, but thankfully, none of her her family um, were hurt physically. Um, but I want to think about this passage for a minute. It's, it's, it says, The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew. Now, the house of their, her parents did not get destroyed by the hurricane itself. It was not the 160 mile an hour winds that took out their house. It was a flood. And you've seen, no doubt, pictures of hurricanes or, or floods, even over in West Tennessee last year. You recall over in Humphreys County that houses were sitting there and the floods came and it just washed the houses right off their foundation and they went off down the river. He who hears these same amount of do them, that no matter if the rains come, the winds come, and the floods rise, that house is going to stand firm. Based on what? Whoever knows the will of God and does it. Who is a doer of the Word. 
Now, I don't want to wear this out, but again, while it's fresh on everybody's mind, I thought about how much money did people spend to get into that game last night? Some of those tickets were going for more than $1,000 a seat. I had some friends who put on their Facebook post that they were going to let theirs go for $600 apiece. But think about that. People spent money on hotel rooms. People spent money on food. People spent money on tickets. Spent all this because they are fans, which is short for what word? Fanatics. That there are people that, whether they have a budget or not, by their decisions, they have budgeted thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars on following the Vols. I saw somebody that was from Alabama. He does not have any season tickets. But since 1972, he has never missed an Alabama football game. He's gone to all the home games, all the away games, all the bowl games, all the national championships. He has not missed a game since 1972. Now you think about that. They've traveled all over this country to play football. And he went. And how much do you think those tickets were? National championship. Now I've said all that to say this. What if we as Christians were that fanatical about our faith? It's almost like some people have a country club mentality about Christianity. That I got baptized, I'm in the club. But as far as my everyday walk, it's not really that passionate. No, I, I, I'm not that faithful in attendance. No, I don't pray like I should. No, I never read my Bible. I don't do so that. But I've made the check marks, and the right check marks is all that matters. When obeying the gospel is really the beginning of our journey, not the end. And that we need to be more passionate about Jesus than anything else in our life. Because really, truthfully, it's the most important thing is our soul salvation and our relationship to Jesus. And yet, Jesus is saying that there are people who are walking with me right now. In fact, if we go back a little earlier, I don't have this on a slide. Let me just read it to you. In verse 15 of this same chapter, Jesus says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. So there were people claiming in Jesus' day to be speaking on behalf of God, and yet, when it came to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One that He had been proclaimed for centuries, when He did finally arrive, did, were they the ones to proclaim the glad message? Were they the ones that were shouting His name and bringing people to Him? No! They became the arch enemies of Jesus. Why did the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the chief rulers, the high priests, why did all of them turn against Jesus even though they saw Lazarus come back from the dead? Even though they saw the blind given sight? They saw the lame walk again. They saw and heard the dumb hear and the deaf, the deaf hear the dumb speak. How could He have done all these wonderful things and spoke these extraordinary truths and yet they became His arch enemy and had Him killed? They truly were wolves in sheep's clothing. Paul reminds us that there are going to be people who are going to be led astray by fables who will seek after themselves teachers that will scratch their ears, that tell them what they want to hear, and be turned aside from the truth unto fables. 
If there was ever a time that that's true, it's true right now in this country. You can find a preacher or a church that will tell you anything you want to believe. And if you want to believe and practice something that is diametrically opposed to what the Scriptures teach, you can still find somebody that will preach it and believe it and practice it. And yet, we're reminded right here by the mouth of Jesus Himself that just because you claim Him as Lord, just because you do religious acts, does not authenticate who you are in Christ. And what I want us to do is to encourage each other, as the Hebrew writers said, let us encourage one another and spur one another unto good works as we see the, the day approaching. And what is the day? The judgment day. To spurn one another on. To encourage one another, To prod one another. It's to push each other along the way. To spur one another on to good works and faithfulness. And so, what we have to understand from this passage is that it is not optional. It's not optional. Um, we, we were talking with Elena's mama over the weekend that schools nowadays, there are some kids that they got it figured out. They're, they're like, got this fine-tuned to the T. They can figure out exactly what is the minimum they have to do to graduate. And that's all they're interested in. Just the minimums. When I was in school, even though I made really good grades, if there was extra credit, I was all over it. I'll take it. Because I wanted to maximize my grade and get it as high as I could get it. There's just some people who just want to get by. And when it comes to a passionate relationship with Jesus, that mindset is still prevalent today. As long as I can slide in the back door of the pearly gates, as long as I make it, that's all I want. When what Jesus wants are passionate people who live what they say in truth. So those that hear these things, I'm not doing them. When the rain comes, the floods come, the winds blow, and the house is beaten on, it withstands. Now, how many people here, you've had the rain, you've had the floods, you've had the wind, and you've took a beat? Anybody? What is that significant of? It's significant of life. What is it that causes some people to walk away from the Lord? In John chapter 6, Jesus was talking about, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part into the kingdom of heaven. And the Bible says, from that day forward, many turned and walked with Him no more. And Jesus looked at the apostles and what did He say to them? Will you also go away? Oh, Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? So what is it that causes some people to not walk with Him anymore? Or to not be fanatical about Him? Or to not be all in for Jesus? What is it? What, are, what is the rain? What is the wind? What is the flood? What is the beating? What are those things? Okay. Pressures from every section of society. Brother Mike, I couldn't hear what you said. The trials of life. Um, let me be honest with you. There are some people that I believe COVID is going to steal their souls. Because COVID has separated them from the body of Christ and they have no intentions of coming back. And they're not sick with it. They just don't want to get out in the crowd anymore. And you know what I found? Some of the people that have been so meticulous in following all the guidelines and washing of hands and wearing masks and all that, you know, in spite of all that, they have still gotten COVID. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. It's not an optional. What did Jesus just say? What about the good tree that bears fruit and the trees that don't bear fruit? I'm going to prune them, gather them up, and burn them. What else? Well, 
How about the cares and riches of this life? Isn't that what Paul said about Demas? Told Timothy to do your diligence to come to me quickly. Demas has forsaken me having loved this present time or the world. He got so busy having fun in this world or being a part of life that he just let his faith go away, drift away. And while, and I want to tell you, I, I enjoy life. I have enjoyed my life all along. I, I love sports. I've played sports all my life. I'm passionate about it. I, uh, I've been all in on so many of them and so many things. But you still have to have a perspective priority. It's kind of like the preacher that was wore out and tired. He called in sick one Sunday. Decided he was going to go play golf. So he went to play golf. Had a hole in one. An angel looked at the Lord and said, Lord, how could you let him get a hole in one while he's playing hooky from the pulpit? And Jesus looked at him and winked and said, who's he going to tell? Whatever you're crazy about, and we all got our craziness, right? Whatever you're crazy about, let me just ask you a question. If it pales, if, if your faith in the Lord and your fanaticism with Jesus pales in comparison to about your other <clears throat> fandom in your life, are things a little skewed? Yeah. So this at the end of this lesson, the Sermon on the Mount, at the end of this discourse, Jesus is actually reminding everybody, everybody, even if you claim Him, do you really claim Him? Then, of course, we have the antithesis. Verse 26 says, But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. <clears throat> now I want to say unequivocally that what I am not saying is that we in any way earn our salvation. Our good works do not save us. Our good works are evidence that we have been saved. Do you see the difference? I don't do what I do for the Lord because I hope that in, if I can pile up enough good stuff that He's going to allow me in. I do what I do on God's behalf because of what He has done in my life. But there are folks that when the rains descended and the winds blew and the floods came up, and beat on that house, it fell, and great was the fall thereof. And that is why it behooves all of us from different times and moments in our walk with Him to take a honest, humble, authentic look at who we are in Christ. And am I living up to my words? You can say some good words and you can do some good things, but are you doing God's will every day? And that really is what the Lord is looking at. Are we authentic in allowing what He's done for us to motivate us to being people doing His will every day? And so it was that when Jesus had ended these sayings, that the people were astonished at His teaching. For He taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now who were the scribes? The scribes were people who by profession were the Xerox people of the day. It is a blessing that we have a copy machine. I'm not even sure what the brand of it is, but we have a nice one back in our office. And it is nice. Back in the day of Jesus, 
There weren't any Xerox machines. So if we needed copies of the Word, that's where a scribe came in. A scribe would have a master, and he would come into this large room, and he would read the words of the book. And the scribes would, by letter, jot, and tittle, which is punctuation, would write down every single letter, character, everything in verbatim of everything that was said to perfection. So much so that if you did that every day of your life, do you think you could become an expert in what it said? Yeah. They knew it, word for word. And yet, the Bible says that when Jesus stopped His teaching, people were, what's the word? Astonished. What does it mean if you're astonished at something? The word is used in our lesson this morning. When, when Peter and John met this lame man who had never walked, and the people saw him walking and jumping and praising God and hanging out with Peter and John in the temple, that they were astonished. They couldn't believe their eyes that this man they'd probably seen his whole life was healed. The same word is used here. They were astonished at his teaching. They had not heard anything like this. Now, had they heard God's word? Yes, but it was skewed. It was tainted. It was filtered through different lenses so that ultimately, whether the people realized it or not, was God who was was God the focus of what they were doing? Who was the focus of what these scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees and rulers? What was the focus of what they were trying to get the people to do? Them. It was about what they wanted. And that everybody succumbed to their will. And ultimately, what they said and what their traditions were trumped what they had become experts in. Copying. What they said became law. Jesus said, In vain do they worship Me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. They were astonished at His teaching, for He taught them as one having authority. Amen. Sir? Uh, absolutely. And here's here's a. <laughs> Cindy said, "Amen." But but always, almost always, with we're dealing with people like the, the religious leaders of that day. They also climb up on the throne to determine who's legit or not, who's right or who's wrong, who's saved, who's not. And when we place ourselves in a seat of judgment where we, we think that we are going ourselves to determine you're saved, you're lost, you're saved, you're lost, you're saved, you're lost. That right there is an indication of someone who is usurping the authority of God. I certainly don't want that job. Anybody here want that job? I don't want that job. Um, but... Jesus is wanting us to know that the litmus test of faith is truly what are you doing with your life? You can claim Him all day long, but what are you doing with your life? And how passionate are you about your faith? And shouldn't that be an encouragement to all of us? I hope so. Our Father in Heaven, we humbly ask You to look down upon us with grace and mercy. For when we look at lessons such as this, we all realize that we fall short. That we all have failed You. We've all said and done things we shouldn't, and we've also failed to do the things that we know are right. So we ask for forgiveness. And we ask that You continue to allow Jesus' blood to be applied to us. And that we will be people of grace and love and encouragement. 
so that we might help each one of us together collectively to be spurred on to continue to do what's right and that you might be pleased with our lives. Father, if we are not authentic, if we are not genuine, convict us of that and help us to have the humility to repent and to make our life right with you that we might have that seasons of refreshing that we talked about this morning and that we might be revived and that we might have a greater zeal and a greater encouragement to continue living out this life that Jesus spoke of. We thank you for your word and its reminder to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hope you all have a great rest of the day.